Welcome to our webinar on new and market ready technologies for commercial and industrial settings. We're so happy to see you online with us today. My name is Andrea and I'll be moderating today's session. Would you please move to the next slide? First I'd like to thank Excel Energy for making today's webinar possible. We are extremely grateful for their generous support of our online education. Please move to the next slide. And now a little bit about our presenters. Drew Morrison and Scott Sheeter are two of my seventh wave colleagues and here they are pictured in their natural habitats. Drew is an energy engineer who applies principles of energy science to inform real building designs and he also educates other professionals about energy efficient technologies and practices. Scott is a senior energy engineer who analyzes building designs, performs technology research, and specializes in large-scale energy modeling. We are very pleased to have them in our studio today to share their expertise with us. And with that, I'll turn it over to Drew and Scott. Uh, thank you, Andrea for that great introduction. Drew, I didn't know you played foosball so vividly. <laughs> I'll have to challenge you to a game here pretty shortly. Oh, yeah. Maybe didn't after the webinar. Didn't know you had such a great uh, scheme. Yeah, occasionally I get out there. <laughs> occasionally I make it outside. Um, yeah, so thanks for joining us today. Uh, today we'll be covering four different technologies, um, with the gist being that energy costs are a major component of any building or, or business's expenses and those costs are, tend to be increasing. So to help reduce those costs, you can use energy efficiency um, to mitigate the impact of the increasing costs. And, and today we're going to cover these four technologies, which are emerging technologies that each reduce energy consumption. We're going to provide an overview of each, as well as typical savings, typical costs, and some other considerations to keep in mind when implementing them on, on projects. We're also going to cover a couple of examples of each to illustrate how they could be used on projects such as yours. Um, the first technology up for today is high volume low speed fans, also called destratification fans. Um, warm air is naturally more buoyant than cold air, so in spaces with high ceiling heights like 20 to 25 feet or greater, the warm air rises to the ceiling. And that can cause significant temperature stratification, meaning that it's very hot at the ceiling level as compared to at the floor or occupied zone. This temperature difference can result in 10 to 30 degrees difference, meaning that if it's 70 degrees in the occupied zone, it can be 90 degrees up at the ceiling. Um, the stratification causes unnecessarily high heat loss through the roof, as well as inefficient heat distribution of the HVAC system. Therefore, high volume low speed fans are a great way of increasing the um, air movement throughout the space and essentially destratifying or reducing that temperature difference from that 10 to 30 degrees down to 2 or 3 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, they're large fans, often 7, 8 feet or more in diameter, and they move significant amounts of air, but slowly, which is key, and we'll kind of discuss that more in a bit. Other benefits they bring are they entail minimal maintenance and they can actually increase occupant comfort and productivity in the space. Um, here's a few different applications where high volume, low speed fans could be implemented. Uh, they're definitely applicable in both industrial and commercial settings in new and retrofit applications. For industrial settings, you can find them in warehouse and distribution centers, as well as even in barns and airplane hangars. Uh, and sometimes machining areas as well. In commercial settings, uh, shopping malls, grocery stores, big box retail, which is where this picture was taken, uh, churches and office buildings, fitness centers and gymnasiums, uh, schools, libraries, and again, warehouses and distribution centers are a great application. So again, anywhere where there's high ceiling heights, uh, destratification fans are applicable. The magnitudes of energy savings will vary um, and depends on a lot of different factors, but it's highest in spaces or buildings where there's long operating hours with limited or no heating temperature setbacks. If the HVAC system has limited air distribution, that will increase energy savings, as well as if the ceiling heights continue to increase, the savings increases. 
Um, if there's minimal roof insulation, that increases energy savings. And unfortunately, although savings from D-strat fans are realized across a variety of HVAC systems, they're not good in conjunction with radiant systems, since in radiant systems, the air temperature is not the heat transfer mechanism. Um, so how do D-strat fans save energy? Well, they do so in a variety of ways. In heating, they effectively move warm air to the occupied zone, which means that they reduce the amount of heating energy that's required. And when stratified, the higher temperatures at the ceiling cause unneeded heat conduction losses through that ceiling or the roof insulation. So by reducing the temperature at the ceiling, uh, D-strat fans can reduce those heating losses. However, the HVAC, or sorry, the D-strat fans themselves use additionally additional electricity to operate, which can be minimized by their fractional horsepower and variable speed. Um, but their energy consumption should be understood in any um, energy savings estimates. Uh, high volume, low speed fans also may be used in spaces with minimal cooling requirements with an effect that's similar to a breeze. So since air movement increases heat transfer off of people or animals, um, if a space doesn't have high cooling requirements like in agriculture, the, the air movement itself can cause the, the, the need for a cooling HVAC, for cooling HVAC equipment to go away, which saves cooling energy as well. Typical energy savings range between 10 cents and 25 cents a square foot of space served. So in a, in a building completely served by HVAC fans that's 10,000 square feet, that would be between $1,000 and $2,500 of reduced energy cost annually. Um, so you're going to reduce your utility bills by using these fans, but how much will they cost to implement? Well, the cost themselves depends on many factors. Especially um, important are the fan's diameter, the motor size, and any accessories that you need, um, along with the fans themselves. And those costs range anywhere from 50 cents to $2 per square foot, meaning that for my 10,000 square foot example, it would cost anywhere between $5,000 and, and, and $20,000, sorry. Um, However, note that the number of fans installed as a space is a key driver of the capital cost and the, the economic payback. So really working with your manufacturers to optimize, not over, not put too many fans in, but just enough to move the, move the air and destratify it without the additional capital cost of too many fans. That, that's really important. Um, here are a couple examples of real world, real world projects in which destratification fans were implemented. Example one represents a nearly 60,000 square foot warehouse in New York State that was heating only served by unit heaters. Five fans were installed and total, the total installation cost approached $30,000. However, the energy consumption both before and after the installation were monitored. So we know that through this, this retrofit, utility bill savings were 13 cents a square foot and the capital cost to implement that savings was about 50 cents a square foot, meaning that the simple payback for those fans was a little over four years. The second example represents an existing 8,500 square foot garden center adjacent to a big box retail store in northern Illinois. The ceiling height of the garden center was 25 feet, so optimal for the use of destratification fans. And the garden center was served by unit heaters, but it had four destratification fans. Um, which meant that it probably had too many um, increasing the capital cost of the project, meant meaning that the nearly $2 per square foot of capital cost resulted in a long payback of nearly 10 years. Had the number of fans been reduced, um, that payback would have come down. Uh, some other considerations to keep in mind when considering implementing destratification fans on your project are acoustical concerns in religious buildings or um, theater settings where the, the stratification noise coming from the fans could be problematic. Um, that needs to be taken into consideration. However, that's not often a problem in industrial facilities. Um, there can be additional installation constraints, particularly in retrofit applications. 
And the activity in the space itself may cause damage, such as balls being thrown and striking the fans in a gymnasium. Uh, if the fans are installed below lights, then a strobe effect that's really disconcerting to occupants can occur. So not mounting them below lights is, is important. And facility staff should be educated on their proper use. When should they be used? When should they not be used? Such that energy savings is, the full e energy savings potential is realized. And lastly, there's potentially drafts causing occupant discomfort if the fan speed is too high. Um, ideally, the airspeed at the head level shouldn't exceed 50 feet per second, or sorry, 50 feet per minute, which is much slower. <laughs> and um, it's hard to measure that, obviously. So unfortunately, the destratification fans are very easily, the speed of, their of the fan is very easily changed. So iterating to find a happy medium between destratification and occupant comfort is pretty straightforward. Um, that was the first technology. And before I turn it over to Drew, I'll cover the second technology as well, um, which is magnetically coupled adjustable speed drives. Um, uh, motors account for a large portion of any facility's energy consumption as they drive fans, pumps, blowers. Um, and motor, motor power is proportional to the cube of its speed, meaning that reducing the motor's speed will drastically reduce its electric consumption. Here we see a plot of that effect. Uh, on the left of this, on the left of this axis is the percent of full power of a given motor as a function of the percent of full speed. This cubic dependence shows the significant energy savings you can, go, you can realize by going to lower speed. And one example of that is if you reduce a motor speed by 50%, you realize 87% reduction in its electric consumption. So significant energy savings can be realized through the use of adjustable speed drives, which allow you to change the motor speed. Um, one type of AS adjustable speed drive, or ASD, is a variable frequency drive, or VFD. Uh, they adjust the motor speed by varying the frequency at which the motor's um, alternating current input. Another form of ASD is the one we're talking about today, which is magnetic coupling. Magnetic coupling uses magnetic fields in place of a physical connection to transfer torque between the motor and load shafts. The torque in the associated load shaft speed may be adjusted by either varying the, the gap distance between, you kind of see it in this figure, the gap distance between the, um, the plates that have the, the permanent magnets in them, or if you're using an electromagnetic mag magnet, you can adjust the current that's going to the electromagnetic to adjust the, the speed of the load shaft. However, the motor itself usually operates at constant speed, but energy savings are still realized since the speed of the load is variable. <coughs> Excuse me. Magnetic coupling. Magnetic coupling may be implemented in both retrofit and new applications on pumps, fans, and blowers that are associated with, in, in, in industry, pulp and paper, mining, food process, raw materials processing, irrigation, power generation, and water treatment, anywhere where motors are, are used. Um, in commercial settings, it's usually on large HVAC systems. It can be implemented in retrofit and new construction, and the magnitude of energy savings depends on many factors. Savings are largest in facilities with long operating hours, large motors, and when magnetic coupling replaces a constant speed, such as that associated with dampers and bypass valves. Uh, energy savings results from the electric demand reduction of the motor, and the magnitude of that energy savings ranges typically between 30 to 80 percent when it's replacing constant speed. However, note that in comparison to uh, if a VFD had been implemented, the savings are usually only about two-thirds. And we'll discuss why using magnetic coupling in some applications makes sense as an alternative to VFDs, even if the savings are reduced in a bit. But now we're going to talk about the absolute costs, um, not, the not the incremental costs 
of the motors. It depends on motor size, accessories, and any installation constraints. Um, however, here in the table you see that for small motors, less than 50 horsepowers, uh, the equipment cost on a dollar per horsepower basis is between $100 and $400. For medium-sized motors, it reduces to $100 to $150. And for large motors, it can be between $50 and $100. They tend to be less expensive than VFDs. In small motors, less than 100 horsepower, if you're using the electromagnetic version of magnetic coupling. And in large motors, if you're using the permanent magnet version. Their typical paybacks, um, when compared to constant speed, are between three and six years. <coughs> uh, again, here's a couple examples of real-world applications in which magnetic coupling was implemented on projects. The first example is a 250 horsepower centrifugal pump retrofit of magnetic coupling at a newsprint, pro newsprint products plant. It's a lot of peas. <laughs> um, the system originally used a bypass flow control valve to regulate flow. But after the retrofit, reduced electric demand by 60% with significant non-energy benefits to boot. Um, note that in this example, the simple payback is nearly four years. The second example represents the retrofit of magnetic coupling on an HVAC system, namely a 75 horsepower condenser and 125 horsepower chilled water pump at an over 1 million square foot office in Seattle, Washington. The system originally used hand valves to regulate flow, but the retrofit reduced electric demand by two-thirds and one-third, respectively, on the condenser and chilled water pumps. It additionally reduced vibration and maintenance issues. And note that the payback, for example, too, is relatively long at about 10 years, but would be reduced in a less mild climate. Seattle just doesn't require much cooling in general. Would it, would it have been shorter in a less rainy climate? <laughs> Probably not. Unfortunately, <laughs> Seattle gets a lot of water, uh, rain. Um, another thing to consider is that these retrofits are um, replacements, early replacements, and not end of life, and that the maintenance cost savings from doing magnetic coupling wasn't considered, which would have brought the payback down even farther. So we kind of mentioned brief previously there's two ways of doing adjustable speed, magnetic coupling and VFDs. Why would you choose magnetic coupling over VFDs? Uh, well, it has vibration isolation. Th there's no physical connection between the motor and the load. So it's great in applications where harmonic distortion is a problem. Uh, there's reduced degradation of the motor winding, insulation, and bearings. There's mo no, voltage, voltage, no voltage doubling, meaning there's no restriction on length of cable between the VFD and the motor, meaning it's a good application for remote settings. There's no need to provide cooling to prevent overheating, and there's reduced limitations at low load speeds, or less than 30%. The VFD parts have historically not been available when you need to fix the VFD because the VFD technology has been a dynamically changing, um, drastically and dynamically changing technology. That's becoming a little less so recently. Um, and there's fewer unplanned outages due to limited noise nuisance dropouts from voltage sags. But the main drawback of using magnetic coupling as opposed to VFDs is that there's, they're just less efficient. You only get about two-thirds of the savings. And um, they cannot drive the load at its full motor speed since sub-slip is needed in order to create the torque. Um, this can result in between 6 and 9 percent peak reduction flow. So an engineer or designer needs to take that into account when designing the motor, potentially upsizing it to account for this. Um, you can require, they can require more physical space because they're mounted, the coupling is mounted in line with the motor and load, which can increase that distance by 8 to 18 inches. Um, typically, that's not a problem, but in mechanical spaces where space is a constraint, um, it can be an issue. But fortunately, they can be mounted with the belt driven to, uh, to bring them up as opposed to out. Um, Finally, some other considerations when implementing magnetic coupling on motors. There are significant energy savings with reduced maintenance and longer life. There's no requirement for housing in a controlled environment, and they're capable of multiple motor starts with no cool-down period. Uh, 
They're applicable in situations where poor power quality would result in frequent nuisance trips, and they inherently protect against load seizure. They're cost effective with medium voltage power supplies since they operate independently of voltage, and they're compatible with existing motors. There's no additional motor heating or derating or thermal expansion of the shaft, and they can be used on motors with greater than 600 volts. And I think that covers the first two technologies today. I'm going to pass the presentation over to Drew for the last two technologies. All right, thank you, Scott. So the last two technologies that we'll be uh, discussing today are um, permanent magnet alternating current motors, uh, which are known often as PMAC motors for short, and kind of a, um, a different flavor or variation on, tech on that technology, which are line start. Uh, PMAC motors. So first of all, what is a PMAC motor? And I think the, the best way to really define what a PMAC motor is is to compare it to an alternative technology, which is the AC or the alternating current induction motor. Um, the AC induction motor is one of the most commonly used motors in uh, any industry and application, and they have been uh, for generations essentially the workhorse uh, of, of uh, any any application which requires uh, converting electrical work or electrical power into mechanical work. Um, so it's one of the most common general general purpose motors uh, on the market. Uh, the technology is simple, uh, reliable, and uh, it can be adapted to a wide variety of applications. However, uh, induction motors have some Im limitations that are inherent in the design, especially with regards to uh, the efficiency of the motor. And new technologies such as the PMAC motor uh, are overcoming uh, some of those limitations. So let's compare how an induction motor works to how a PMAC motor works. So uh, as the name of the motor would suggest, an induction motor works uh, via the uh, phenomenon of electromagnetic induction. So alternating current is fed to the copper windings of the rotor stator, which is the part that does not move. Uh, and that creates um, a rotating magnetic field. Uh, this magnetic field induces uh, an electric current in the electrically conductive material of the uh, motor's rotor, uh, which is the rotating part, the physically rotating part of the motor. Uh, this electrically conductive material is uh, usually uh, aluminum bars or some similar material. And the bars essentially um, are kind of what would you would look at and uh, essentially kind of, like a, um, kind of like a mouse wheel or like a, something that often uh, lends uh, the term that you may have heard before is the, the squirrel cage. But there's actually not a mouse wheel in the motor is what you're saying. I don't think so. Okay. I'm pretty sure that a mouse isn't running to, uh, you know, to create the motion. I hope our technology is advanced. We will pass that down. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, uh, that moving electric current uh, the, creates a secondary induced electromagnetic uh, field that follows the moving electric, uh, uh, the moving magnetic field in the stator. And that creates, uh, generates torque and rotation, which is what causes the mechanical rotation of the motor. Uh, the moving electric current, however, has uh, some energy losses associated with that, um, essentially because it's current moving through an electric resistance. So some energy is lost uh, because of that, which limits the maximum efficiency of what an induction motor can produce. Uh, another uh, uh, limitation of the induction motor is a phenomenon called slip, uh, which means that the secondary magnetic field isn't quite able to travel as quickly as the primary rotating magnetic field in the stator. So the, ro the motor, the shaft, can't rotate quite as quickly as it might be able to uh, otherwise if there was no slip. PMAC motors, in contrast, do not use an <coughs> induced electromagnetic field to generate rotation. They use permanent magnets or a permanent magnetic field to do so. Uh, these permanent magnets are usually uh, alloys of uh, rare earth metals, uh, although some alternative materials are being investigated by some researchers and manufacturers, which uh, we'll get to uh, in a little while. Uh, using the permanent magnets rather than uh, electromagne electromagnets preserves the simplicity and the reliability of the induction motor design while offering a higher uh, energy efficiency and also the opportunity for synchronous operation by eliminating the slip that we mentioned earlier. 
Um, also, the permanent magnets have a very high magnetic flux density or very powerful magnetic fields. It's kind of like uh, just a, a much, much stronger version of the uh, permanent magnets that might have been in you know, your uh, science set when you were a kid. But those were fantastic. Um, and because the magnetic fields are so strong, it allows uh, manufacturers to use a smaller frame size and less material or less weight to provide a motor, motor that, uh, motor that uh, delivers a certain, you know, a given uh, required torque or motor power. So some of the applications that PMAC motors are especially suited to um, are uh, things like fluid movement, so pumps, fans, and blowers, both in industrial applications and in commercial buildings in HVAC. Uh, and certain other industrial applications would be um, applications which require delivering high torque at low speed, so uh, such as conveyors, mixers, grinders, that kind of thing. Uh, also, um, applications which require a high power to size or power to weight ratio. So these would be things such as the automotive industry, uh, maritime applications where space is especially a concern, uh, as well as agricultural applications, uh, grain combines, things like that, as well as applications uh, where uh, grid power is not available. Uh, also, uh, the magnitude of energy savings uh, associated with PMAC motors depends on a variety of factors. Uh, motor savings are larger in facilities where there's a lot of operating hours and uh, large motor powers that are required, uh, you know, obviously. Uh, and as well as applications which have highly variable speed requirements or highly variable uh, loads. And we'll get in and talk about that in just a moment. So, um, how large are the energy savings of PMAC motors when you compare them to induction motors? Well, uh, typically, um, the full load efficiency of, uh, at least the difference in full load efficiency between PMAC motors and uh, induction motors depends, first of all, on the motor size. Uh, so efficiency gains are actually uh, compared to, relative to induction motors, are larger at smaller motor horsepowers. Uh, they can range from, the efficiency gain can range from about 1% at motors in about the 100 horsepower class uh, to about 1.5% at uh, the 10 horsepower class. And those full load efficiency gains continue to increase as the motors dip towards the one horsepower and fractional horsepower classes as well. And this is uh, versus a NEMA premium efficiency rated motor, and those efficiency gains are larger when you compare them to other motor classes, such as uh, NEMA standard efficiency. Another important thing to note is that the efficiency, begins, uh, the efficiency gains become much more pronounced when the motors, when you start to operate these motors at less than their full rated speed. Uh, the efficiency curve uh, versus speed for PMAC motors tend to be uh, what we would call flatter than induction motors. Uh, what this means is that, uh, for example, if you look at this graph here on the left, we've plotted the motor efficiency versus the percent of maximum motor speed for both uh, a NEMA premium induction motor, which is this blue curve here on the bottom, and a PMAC motor, which is this orange curve here on the top. Uh, and I should mention before we go on that this is for a... Uh, uh, I think a three horsepower motor uh, used in a, uh, in a fan application. So you can see that the, for the NEMA premium motor, the efficiency peaks at about 80, 89 to 90 percent and about 90 uh, percent of its full speed. And it drops off, uh, it decreases in a very pronounced fashion as the motor speed uh, drops uh, below its full rated speed. Um, however, in uh, in the case of the PMAC motor, uh, you can see that both the full load efficiency is higher and also that efficiency drop is much less pronounced as the speed decreases. So in any application where you have to vary the motor speed, such as uh, you know, when you're driving the motor with a VFD or perhaps one of those uh, magnetically, magnetically perhaps a magnetically coupled drive, um, uh, you really start to see uh, much more pronounced savings <coughs> with a PMAC versus an induction motor. Uh, now that we've discussed the efficiency of these motors, let's talk about the typical costs. Uh, now, there's a, several factors which influence the cost of a PMAC motor. Uh, first of all, of course, the motor size, uh, as well as what material the permanent magnets are constructed out of. Uh, unfortunately, it's somewhat difficult to really pin down what the cost <coughs> of a PMAC motor actually is. 
uh, especially ones that use rare earth magnets. And that's because the, the market for rare earth, that <coughs> rare earth metals is very volatile. Supply and therefore cost uh, moves up and down quite a bit. And that's mostly because the market and supply is controlled by uh, a very small number of, of uh, mines and suppliers. However, um, an alternative mag magnet material is uh, what's called ferrite magnets. Uh, and those, uh, that market is much less volatile. So manufacturers which use those, and there are a few, uh, are able to hedge against those uh, cost fluctuations. Uh, uh, however, some sources have identified that the the cost premium or the incremental cost of PMAC motors uh, versus induction motors is somewhere in the range of 20 to 70 percent. Uh, and of course, uh, if uh, any payback uh, would uh, probably, I would recommend using a, some sort of engineering feasibility study that takes into account both the incremental cost of the motor as well as the duty cycle that the uh, motor will undergo in its intended application. Uh, we'll discuss uh, two um, economic examples of using uh, PMAC motors <coughs> versus induction motors. Uh, the first example is um, uh, a bench test that was conducted by a California utility uh, of a, a PMAC versus induction motors in a five horsepower um, HVAC supply fan application. So in this test, the PMAC motor was evaluated against uh, two control motors. One was a standard efficiency and the other was a premium efficiency, that's NEMA rated uh, induction motor. So the test so showed uh, estimated electricity cost savings of about uh, $11.30 per horsepower against the premium efficiency motor and about $16 uh, per horsepower against the standard efficiency motor. Uh, capital cost information and simple payback periods were not reported in the study, however. Uh, the second example was uh, a replacement uh, of a uh, two-speed induction motor, uh, about 40 horsepower that was used in a cooling tower application uh, in British Columbia. Uh, now again, the <coughs> motor was a uh, two-speed motor and that means it was uh, coupled to the cooling tower fan using a gearbox. So this motor was replaced by a PMAC motor uh, with a VFD uh, and uh, no gearbox, so it was coupled directly uh, via the shaft to the cooling tower fan. So in the study, the power input of the original uh, motor, two-speed motor assembly was measured at both its high and its low speeds. Uh, and then after that, the uh, old motor was replaced with the PMAC motor, uh, and the power was measured again, again at both those speeds uh, controlled by the VFD setting. Uh, after those measurements, the simple payback was measured at about uh, 18 months. Uh, although it should be noted that, again, this retrofit uh, involved not just changing out the motor, but also going from a dual speed drive to a full VFD. And uh, that change um, would, would have accounted for some portion of the utility savings. And we'll discuss some of the benefits and drawbacks of using a PMAC motor compared to induction motors. So uh, the, one of the first benefits, of course, is the energy savings that results from increased efficiency. And again, those energy savings become even more pronounced when the motor application involves operating the motor at partial load or partial speed. Uh, there's also, uh, because the uh, PMAC motor is more efficient than induction motors, it also runs at lower temperatures, which means that there's less degradation of both the motor winding insulation and also the motor bearings, uh, meaning that there's generally longer service life and uh, lower maintenance requirements. Uh, as we discussed earlier, a PMAC motor is, able, uh, is capable of synchronous rather than asynchronous operation, so there's no motor slip. Uh, the speed of the motor is essentially determined by the frequency of the AC, of the AC voltage that's applied, as well as the number of uh, poles in the stator. Uh, because we have these very strong permanent magnets, there's also a higher power to size and power to weight ratio, which means that for a given application and power requirement, you can use a motor uh, with less weight and smaller frame sizes. And finally, because the motor operates cooler, there's less waste heat uh, transmitted to the environment and also reduce cooling requirements. Some of the drawbacks, however, is uh, there's a phenomenon associated with these motors called back EMF. And what that means is that at very high speeds, the motor um, at least starts to operate in some capacity as uh, a generator. So there's a, a reverse electromotive uh, force um, that uh, starts to uh, 
uh, that starts to uh, be generated. Uh, this becomes more of a problem uh, at very high speeds rather than very low speeds. So this back EMF essentially limits the maximum speed at which PMAC motors are uh, able to operate at. Uh, because of both the very powerful magnets in this back EMF phenomenon, there are some uh, increased uh, safety requirements associated with this motor. For, for example, if a motor is being disassembled for service, uh, the high magnetic fields uh, generate uh, you know, uh, concern about pinch hazards. Uh, and also, um, people who have pacemakers or other uh, medically implanted devices should exercise caution around these very strong magnetic fields. Um, also, uh, when the motor is operating there's, or spinning in any uh, way, the back EMF uh, generates a potential shock hazard. However, when the rotor of the motor is actually in the motor housing, the radiated magnetic energy is quite small, uh, so these uh, hazards are mitigated, well, as long as the motor is, of course, uh, fully assembled. Uh, Another uh, consideration is that most PMAC motors require uh, what's often referred to as a matched drive, uh, which is usually uh, a VFD uh, that has uh, particular software or um, electronics that are designed specifically for the PMAC, for the motor that's actually being used. So you, when you're procuring PMAC motors, you need to make sure that whatever uh, drive that you're procuring along with it is capable of operating with that motor. Uh, and we'll discuss that. Um, that problem is overcome by the line start PMAC motor, which I referred to earlier, and we'll discuss that uh, shortly. Uh, also, another final consideration is, again, the capital cost volatility that's associated with the motors. So be careful when you're procuring the motors and also determining PMAC. So now that we've talked about sort of the uh, first flavor of PMAC motors, let's, uh, we'll talk about line start PMAC motors, which again, as I mentioned, uh, help overcome some of the problems with requiring a matched drive. Now, how do line start PMAC motors differ from uh, their uh, just non-line start vanilla cousins? Um, I think probably the best way to talk about this or discuss this is to have a discussion about how uh, you know, line power uh, is transmitted to the motor to create motion. Uh, so here uh, in this slide, I've, uh, we have sort of a flow chart of how power is transmitted to a motor. And on the left is just a regular PMAC motor, and on the right is a line start PMAC motor. So uh, first you have your generally three-phase three uh, AC power, uh, and then generally with a PMAC motor that is transmitted to the motor drive, uh, which has drive electronics and software which converts that power into a form that the uh, PMAC motor can use. Uh, because there's electronics in the drive, there's generally some minor, um, uh, minor power losses that's associated with that. Uh, as some of you who are, as if you're familiar with VFDs, I'm sure uh, it comes as no surprise. Um, then once that power is conditioned, it is transmitted to the PMAC motor, which again converts that electrical power into mechanical work. The PMAC out motor, however, uh, that the need for that drive is eliminated. So the line power uh, is able to be transmitted directly from the motor, uh, sorry, from the uh, line to the motor. Uh, how is this accomplished? Well. It's uh, a, PMA, a line start motor is generally sort of a hybrid design between an induction motor and a PMAC motor. So there's a start, there's a start winding within the rotor, which is sort of your traditional squirrel cage induction uh, uh, technology, and that winding is used to start the motor uh, via uh, electromagnetic induction. However, once the motor gets up to uh, you know full speed and essentially reaches its steady operation state. Uh, the permanent magnets essentially take over and produce the torque rather than the squirrel cage, and that allows the motor to operate more or less how a regular PMAC motor would operate. So some of the considerations when you're uh, considering perhaps a line start motor versus a regular PMAC motor or an induction motor is that again, uh, as I mentioned, the losses associated with a VFD or the match drive uh, are eliminated. Uh, however, a line start motor is still able to maintain a synchronous operation after it starts, so it'll uh, operate at the same uh, at a frequency that's uh, some uh, some multiple of the frequency of the line power. 
However, another thing to consider is that uh, rather than uh, uh, regular PMAC motors, which operate at a higher power factor generally than induction motors, uh, line start PMAC motors uh, operate at a power factor that's more similar to induction motors, which means that there's a bit more reactive power associated with using line start PMAC motors uh, rather than uh, uh, non-line start PMAC motors. All right. That concludes our uh, discussion of uh, PMAC motors and line start PMAC motors, and I think now we have uh, uh, some talk about uh, some of the uh, rebate opportunities that's available from Excel. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Excel Energy has developed programs to support increased implementation of the technologies we discussed today through rebates that help offset a portion of their incremental cost. Prescriptive rebates are available for pod projects incorporating alternating current PMAC motors from 1 to 500 horsepower. For both new and upgrades operating at 60 hertz and exceeding NEMA premium efficiency by at least 1%, these rebates are available. Please see the motor application for rules and requirements for your state. Additionally, custom rebates are available for the other three technologies that we discussed today. Um, However, pre-approvals are required, so please contact Excel before purchasing and installing. And you know, I think that wraps up the majority of our uh, content for today. Uh, we covered a lot. And um, just a reminder to viewers to answer the polls under the pie icon, as well as um, we developed a series of um, technology profiles that are linked under the eye icon. So if we talk too quick or maybe didn't say things in a way that is easily digestible over video format, uh, reviewing those is a great way to, to get the full uh, content that we're hoping to, to portray today. And please submit any questions that you have with the chat balloon. We're hoping to uh, answer a few of them now, uh, but if we don't get to them, we'll happy to answer them later uh, if you're able to provide your email as well. Mentioned the pie icon, it kind of that makes me kind of Jones for pie right now. Yeah, we should definitely go eat after this. I'm just going to read the questions and you're going to them out loud, okay? Okay, we're going to be asked questions off screen and then I'll repeat them and hopefully we can answer them. So this is from Jason. He wonders about PMAX. Is this motor controllable through the BMX? Uh, the question is, are PMAC motors controllable through BMS? To BMS is in building building management system, I believe. Uh, I, uh, I think uh, I think the PMAC motors I think is the line start PMAC motor probably, but uh, I think uh, most PMAC motors that are not line start would require um, having uh, that matched uh, variable frequency drive with uh, correct power electronics and software. So uh, as long as the BMS uh, uh, can probably control as long as it is uh, mediated via that drive. So the BMS could control the drive and then the drive would control the motor. There's another one. Um, do you have any recommended resources to check out to find out more about these technologies? Like what did you use to put together this lecture? Yeah, so the question was uh, what resources did we use to put together the, so are there other resources that someone could check out to learn more? And uh, I'll, I'll start and to feel free to jump in, Drew. Um, a lot of the, the resources out there were publicly available. Um, a lot of great research out of California. Uh, eSource is another great recommendation. Um, and we've posted uh, the majority of the major resources that we used on our, uh, on our website. Uh, it's linked via this through the resources link. I forget what the icon actually looks like. It's the eye icon. Sorry, I should have known that. So the resources we use, if for more information, you're um, happy to use that to, to dig deeper. Yeah, I think, uh, I think Scott did a very good job summarizing where you can go out and get some of the resources that we used. But to, to give you just an overview of some of the resources uh, that we looked at for PMAC motors, uh, there are, again, as Scott mentioned, some great research uh, coming out of California and some other um, sort of uh, case studies of PMAC motors. Um, where they were applied. Um, also, there's uh, quite a few um, resources uh, available from manufacturers of PMAC motors, uh, which we use to assemble some information. So um, 
I think those uh, sources should also be available uh, if you click the eye icon. Gentlemen, um, are there any settings in which PMAC motors are not recommended? So, any settings in which PMAC motors are not re recommended? Let's see. So, in any any settings in which PMAC motors are not recommended? I think uh, you'll just have to evaluate both. Um, I think in starting with perhaps just an engineering cost feasibility analysis. So that would probably involve uh, talking to a manufacturer's motor representative, analyzing what the energy savings might be versus uh, an induction motor, and just seeing if uh, you know the payback period is short enough for it to make financial sense. Um, also, uh, you know, in applications where I think uh, some of the drawbacks of uh, PMAC motors become significant concerns. So if they're are safety concerns or uh, you know places where um, line power is probably power quality is poor um, then those are probably places where uh, using PMAC motors would not be recommended. Makes sense. Um, are there any ground requirements for magnetic couplings like there are for variable frequency gaps? So the question is uh, are there any ground requirements for magnetic coupling as opposed to uh, like VFDs? And um, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I don't believe there are, but that's something I can dig into a little deeper and hopefully answer with a little more detail and, and uh, confidence after the webinar is complete. And then getting a few more questions in. The harmonic, in, in, my, in my review, the harmonic distortion was the major reason to use magnetic coupling. You know, there was strong vibrations from the load, which resulted in damage to the motor and the um, associated controls. The, uh, the magnetic coupling, therefore, is a great use of that application. But short of having harmonic distortions, um, if one of the other major drawbacks of magnetic coupling wasn't available, I'd say using a VFD is probably uh, the better application due to its higher uh, energy savings. And um, on that note, another follow-up question on the harmonics part. The motors with issues of harmonics are 200 to 300 horsepower, 480 volt. Which type would be better for this application? Um, that's a really detailed question. I, <laughs> I think it's probably worth uh, yeah, following up on that one. Yeah, so if you did ask that question, please make sure your email address is attached so we can uh, we can follow up with more detail later. Here's another one. Um, power factor effects on PMAC. Mm -hmm. If PMAC motor is loaded very lightly, what does power factor drop as low as it would for a lightly loaded induction motor? <laughs> if, let me try to rephrase that. If a PMAC motor is loaded very lightly, mm -hmm. What is the effect of power? Fa what is the effect on the power factor of that motor? Say, um, I think that might be a better question again to follow up on. Uh, so because that's again a uh, rather detailed uh, question about uh, how uh, PMAC you know, motors operate uh, with their you know, electronics. So again, if you provide your email address, uh, we will uh, be sure to follow up with you on that point. Is there a particular market space or application where we might expect to see faster adoption of PMAC motors? Like, where have you seen the most activity in conversion to PMAC? Yeah, so, what what sectors are the ha currently have the highest penetration or are likely to have higher penetration of PMAC motors in the future? So, I think uh, at least from some of the research that I came across, it seems again that the the Applications where power to weight or power to size ratio becomes very important is probably the ones where uh, PMAC motors are uh, uh, penetrating the most quickly uh, and gaining more market share. Um, so again, um, probably the automotive application and uh, as well as uh, maritime applications. Um, another thing to mention is that um, one thing that I did find was that uh, PMAC motors are available in some different form factors. Uh, so essentially different shapes, so things like pan called pancake motors, which I think are used quite commonly in electric or uh, hybrid uh, electric vehicles. And then a anywhere where, you know, do you covered the application, the reasons why energy savings would be higher for PMAC, like long duty cycles, and mm -hmm. anywhere where that 
is, is a case, or anywhere where electric utility costs are significantly higher would, would co bring back the payback of the more efficient PMAC motors and therefore increase market penetration. And here's another one. Can you explain how a VFD and magnetic coupled ASD work together, or can you eliminate the VFD altogether and control it through the building automation system? Yeah, so it's a question about VFDs versus magnetic coupling. Do they ever work together and um, how they tie to the BA, building automation system, the BAS? And in my, my review, um, it tended to be one or the other. You, know, you, you did VFDs or you did magnetic coupling. It was never both. Um, and to that, to that extent, um, you know, I kind of covered this in the slide, but the, the main reason to do magnetic coupling was because of the harmonic distortions, because of maintenance concerns, um, whereas doing the VFD would get you more savings, but maybe um, not eliminate those as rapidly because of the, the vibration and physical connection that's still required during the VFD. hope I answered that one. All the questions that have come in so far. So, yeah, thanks for attending. Um, it would be great if you could, before you leave, attend our uh, do the Survey Monkey do the, the uh, go to the Survey Monkey link in uh, your confir confirmation email and just fill that out. And uh, hope you learned something. We certainly did, and um, appreciate your time today. <laughs>